Hello, everyone. This is the August presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I am still Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History and will be your host today. As always, let me start with a few administrative details. A reminder, all recent past and future First Wednesday online lectures are now available on our new Friends of History webpage friendsofhistorynm.org. Just click on the lecture series link at the top of the homepage. Our monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with support from the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations. These funds will directly go to support the lecture series and more importantly, all History Museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make an, a donation, just go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Looking toward our September presentation, our speaker will be Jeff Shepard, Professor of History at the University of Texas in El Paso. On September 1st, Jeff will discuss the Apache Treaty of 1852. Jeff is a noted expert on the treaty and its ramifications. If you wish to be on our mailing list in preparation for that, or to learn more about this lecture and upcoming lectures, you can sign up on our webpage or email us at the address cited in the chat below. Now for today's lecture. We're happy to have with us Steve Post, research associate with and former de de deputy director of the Office of Archaeological Studies. Having spent most of his 45 year archaeological career in New Mexico, Steve has been afforded the opportunity to study 12,000 years of this state's past. He directed excavations for the New Mexico History Museum's the Medici Building and Santa Fe Community Convention Center from 2002 to 2008. Findings at these locations include evidence of Santa Fe's earliest farmers, remnants of one of the villages of Oge Poge, foundations and facilities of 18th and 19th century residential and military compounds, and foundations and basements from one of Santa Fe's 20th century schools. He was, he, he, he was a co-curator of the History Museum's 2009 to 2018 Santa Fe Found exhibit, uh, in, which was in the palace as well. Today, Steve will present an overview of the new palace seen and unseen exhibit, which is now on view in the Palace of Governors. This is justly the first of several exhibits opening in the next few months in this National Historic Site now that it is again open to the public. The exhibit integrates documentary records with the material evidence uncovered by more than 100 years of archeology span at the palace. With this approach, Steve will guide us through the many changes that have occurred to the palace and its grounds since 1610 and before. Historical information has been gleaned from governors, priests, prisoners, soldiers, and traders through documents, memoirs, maps, and photographs. Archaeological insights come from excavations within and outside the palace, where stone foundations and buried facilities reflect over 350 years of architectural change. The recovery of more than one million artifacts connect us to the diverse peoples who have lived and worked in this unique historical structure. The exhibit was developed by Steve together with his co-curators, Cordelia Snow and Alicia Romero. Following the presentation, Steve will answer any questions you may have. The questions and comments can be posted at any time uh, on, this, on the YouTube chat room, both, both during and after the presentation. Upon completion of today's event, the entire presentation will be posted on the Friends of History webpage, as well as on the History Museum's YouTube and Facebook pages. So now, 
Let us welcome Steve Post. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you here today. And uh, I really thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about one of my favorite topics, the Palace of the Governors, and in this case, the brand new exhibit that opened on June 24th in the west end of the Palace of the Governors that we've titled The Palace Seen and Unseen, A Convergence of History. Um, obviously, an exhibit of this kind, or most exhibits, require a community of people to put it together. And I'd briefly like to thank some of the individuals who worked so hard on this and made it possible. Um, as Ben mentioned, my co-curators, Dee Dee Snow, who is a longtime palace historian and mythbuster, historical archeologist and staff archeologist with the New Mexico History Historic Preservation Division. And Dr. Alicia Romero, curator of Nuevo Mexicana, Mexicano History at the New Mexico History Museum. It was truly an honor and pleasure to work with these two amazing scholars. I'd also like to acknowledge Director Billy Garrett for his support and input and for allowing the exhibit to proceed after his appointment in April 2019. When you visit the exhibit, you'll notice that it's really quite beautifully and professionally designed. And I'd really like to give special thanks to the folks I worked with on Santa Fe Found um, back in 2009 who worked on this exhibit, in, including Caroline Lejoie, Natalie Baca, and newly Matt Seleski, and a new editor, Dr. Maggie Pond. Um, I'd also like to thank the Museum of New Mexico Foundation um, for their support, and Judy and, Gorson, Judy and Gordon Wilson for providing substantial support for the glass that now covers the floor hatches in room five. I'd like to also give you a little background behind the exhibit process. Planning began under former director Andy Wolf in December of 2018. The scope and story went through many changes, eventually finding a home in the west end of the palace where the exhibit Santa Fe found occupied the same rooms, as Ben said, from 2009 to 2018. Early in his tenure, Dr. Garrett requested an exhibit that was confined to the walls and left the rooms open with an element of portability to allow for further future uses of the rooms. He also wanted an exhibit that didn't distract from the innately attractive interior architecture. Also, the Museum Conservation Division advised that climate sensitive objects, manuscripts, photos, et cetera, could not be displayed in the palace without provisions for their long-term protection. As hung today, the exhibit successfully meets all of these requirements and I believe offers the visitor varied and interesting perspectives on the history of a unique place in North America's past and present. There we are. To access the exhibit, you will walk to the east end of the atrium to the door leading into the courtyard where you will find a beautiful panel that introduces the exhibit. Displayed on the panel is an immaculate conception of Mary Caravaca cross. The double cross depicts the immaculate conception of Mary on the vertical bar. Caravaca crosses were popular in the 17th century and were, were worn or affixed to a to a wall, door, or bedpost for protection against evil and for their healing powers. Such crosses were used by all people of all classes of the Catholic faith, and they continue to be highly revered in Caravaca de la Cruz, Murcia, Spain, the origin of these crosses. Archaeologists found this Caravaca cross with other personal and household items in a refuse area where the Domenici building atrium is located today. Entering the portal transition to the courtyard, you see the north wall of the palace. To the west is the west hallway entrance, 
which leads to the exhibit. Before you head to the exhibit, you'll see two panels titled Anatomy of an Adobe Wall and Beyond the Courtyard. They're affixed to the west wall of the northeast annex of the former Segesser Hyde Room. Anatomy of an Adobe Wall briefly talks about the history of Adobe in the world and the American Southwest and how Adobes were made and who made them in the past. The 1934 ex exposed Adobe Wall is an apt backdrop for this subject matter. Beyond the Courtyard talks about the many uses of and changes to the courtyard and the yard, garden, presidio space behind the palace courtyard through time. I think these panels are the first to introduce the visitor to historical and architectural aspects of the courtyard and the space occupied by the Domenici building. Walking west through the courtyard and entering the west hallway, you will see the main introductory panel. This panel introduces the visitor to the exhibit's underlying themes that focus on the contributions that history and archaeology make to obtaining a better understanding of a very fragmentary story of the palace's evolution as a building and place. The story is told through the eyes of 350 years of residents, officials, visitors, and prisoners who left written accounts, maps, images, and material objects at, within, or beneath the palace. The exhibit reflects the diverse backgrounds and perspectives of the palace's people. We also acknowledge that despite the lack of any known written documentation, oral tradition indicates that a diverse group of people interacted with the palace throughout the building's history. We know that missing from the written and photographic records are the voices of children, African descended and native slaves and servants, and many everyday residents of the area. This, these unseen people made daily contributions to the life at palace, but left faint traces of their experiences. In offering this exhibit, we submit that when the dynamic interplay of historians and archeologists converge, a richer story and better understanding emerges. It is this integrative approach to what is seen and unseen that guides the themes explored by the exhibit. There is no better place for this to happen than at the Palace of the Governors. Also, while in the hallway of the Palace, Also, while in the hallway of the, the West Hallway, you may notice panel left, to your left. One of these panels is titled 100 Years of Archaeology. It highlights the many projects that contributed to our studies of the palace, included Dee Dee Snow's 1974-1975 excavations beneath the floors and in the west end of the palace and the excavations I directed on the land now occupied by the Domenici building. The panel is divided into inside and outside archeology span with the most recent project completed in 2018. Entering the exhibit, you see the first of the exhibit panels. Exam exhibit panels. Note that each is headed with a timestamp, which is the year that is important to the panel's subject matter and orients the visitor chronologically as they move through the exhibit. The panels titled Place of Water and a Good Place to Build a Life briefly introduce the visitor to the deep past of Santa Fe and the palace grounds as ancestral lands of Taylor speaking people of the Northern Rio Grande Valley and more specifically the Pueblo of Tezuque. 10,000 years before the common era is an estimated temporal designation for the earliest peopling of the area. 1325 common era marks a time when Ogopoge, the first village to occupy this place was a thriving community that stretched from downtown Santa Fe along the Santa Fe River to modern day Agua Fria, except for a brief hiatus between 1425 and 1610, the upper Santa Fe River Valley and its environs have supported village, via, and city life for more than 700 years. Moving further into the room, you will see a panel 1610 colonial beginnings. This panel briefly takes the visitor to the founding of Santa Fe, earliest construction of the palace between 1610 and 1620 
by Native American laborers and the trials and tribul tribulations of establishing an imperial outpost in such a remote place in a land already occupied and revered by its first people. From documents, we know they had a full complement of carpentry and masonry tools and specialists to use them. However, tools were always in short supply. We show in ads similar to those that were used by carpenters to work vigas, latillas, and lintels in the 17th and 18th centuries. The ads is one of the fewer larger scale stable objects that we're able to show um, under the Museum of Conservation, I mean, the Conservation Division guidance for exhibits in the Palace of the Governors. Sixteen fifty nine Royal House talks about how the palace was built by native laborers on the direction of guild trained master masons and carpens, carpenters. They turned the Casas Reales into a symbol of Spain's imperial power. We believe the palace was similar to early colonial governmental compounds and private residences throughout New Spain, which adhered to Spanish architectural customs whenever possible. While the modern palace is a one-story building, evidence found in the archeological excavations and gleaned from eyewitness accounts suggest that it had two stories and was quite grand in its style and layout. The elevation plan shown in the drawing here is that of the Hacienda Tapalca, a 17th century residence in San Miguel, Mexico, a building exhibiting a style palace builders would have emulated. It is notable for having two stories and a tower at one end. At the palace, three foot wide foundation and covered during Didi's team by Didi's team were typical of what is found supporting two story Spanish colonial buildings and our primary infer inferential evidence that the palace had two stories at that time. In 1661, Governor Bernardo Lopez de Mendizabal and his wife, Doña Teresa de Aguilera y Roche, described the palace as an imposing two-story adobe structure built around a large interior courtyard that was partly enclosed by a grand corridor or, or arcade. It anchored an extensive complex of an armory, coach house, stables, gardens and orchards. Unlike today, the south side of the palace lacked a portal. Translucent selenite or mica sheets filled small window openings covered with wooden gratings or frames. Though they were accused of practicing Judaism and tried before the Inquisition, Governor Mendizabal and his wife, Doña Teresa, lived an upper-class life in Santa Fe. Fragmentary objects like this piece of Chinese porcelain found during Didi's excavations attest to the elite standard of living, which has tied, which was tied to a global economy during the 17th century. Nuevo Mexico was tied to the global econ economy by the Manila Galleon and the Camino Real. In 1680, return to an ancestral home, we provide a little more information about the part that the palace played in the Pueblo Revolt in the 14 years that followed until the Spanish military campaign of suppression and retribution. Following the expulsion of the colony from Santa Fe on August 23rd, 1680, descendants of Ogapoge and other Pueblo people returned and built a four-story adobe village enclosing two plazas marked by two kivas. The outside walls formed a defensible perimeter while terraced room blocks cascaded inward to the plaza. Rooms were entered through their roofs. The palace and the Casas Reales were incorporated into the Pueblo style village layout. We learned about the layout of the building and its residents from Don, Governor Don Diego de Vargas's accounts of his 1692 reconnaissance of New Mexico and his violent return in December, 1693. The panel shows a map layout of a 17th century 
Mission Pueblo located at San Cristobal in the Galisteo Basin. A representative profile of a terraced Pueblo village and a few of the Pueblo Revolt era artifacts recovered from below the palace floors and north of the palace grounds. Here I focus on a bronze bell fragment that was probably from one of the three religious structures operating in Santa Fe at that time. The buildings were raised and their contents taken or destroyed. Metal was a high value item for all who lived in Nuevo Mexico. Well, it is written that Pope, one of the revolt leaders exhorted the people to cast off all things Spanish. We are pretty sure that there was much that they kept using, including bronze from the bells of the many mission churches. Spanish priests and guildsmen trained Pueblo men in the craft of metallurgy and smithing, skills they would apply to scashing, fashioning arrow points and lash from the metal objects left behind. I'd like to speak a moment about floor hatches and floor silhouettes. The floor hatches and linear, linear silhouettes are visible on the room floor. The two hatches along the south wall are now glassed over and very well lit. The south hatch shows the diagonal adobe brick floor and adobe brick wall stub and cobble foundation of a Spanish room found by Didi's excavations. The north hatch shows the same floor and foundations, but with narrower stubs of adobe walls inserted into the Spanish rooms by Pueblo builders following the Pueblo revolt. The remains of these four rooms are the only evidence of the Pueblo village described by Vargas that have been found in the downtown area by archeologists. The stained silhouettes project foundation alignments across the floor. So for the first time, the visitor can see the full extent of the size and layout of these 17th century Spanish and Pueblo rooms. 1694 Spanish return, robberies and reconstruction, talks about the time from the late 10th, 17th century and early 18th century when even more evidence of two story buildings with a sprawling array of rooms in an unending state of disrepair is gleaned from documents detailing trials involving robberies and an arriving governor's report on the condition of the colony and the palace. In the 1694 trial of palace burglar Augustin Saez, we learn about the captured Pueblo that Vargas and his Pueblos occupied. From a second story room, Saez admitted to stealing Vargas's rubber boots and a chocolate cup among other possessions. In his 1715 residencia, Governor Feliz Martinez described a dilapidated building supported by nine buttresses with ceilings propped up by massive posts and only two functional rooms. One upstairs and another downstairs were part of a large apartment used as a chapel where soldiers prayed the rosary. The south facade of the palace was penetrated by at least one spacious zaguan or passageway that connected the plaza to an interior patio with a well, which also, the patio also served as a parade ground. Two-story buildings on the north courtyard contained a hayloft with a coach room for storage of a sila volante or light carriage and a non-functioning mule-powered flour mill. My Domenici building excavation revealed three foot wide foundations beneath the print shop that may be remnants of the described outbuildings. In 1719, Isidro Sanchez robbed the palace storeroom through a second story window taking bolts of cloth that he wrapped in Campeche blankets. To light the way, he had borrowed a candle from a guard which Isidro lit with his firebox using a chispa, perhaps similar to the one shown here. A chispa is used to strike a flint, which creates a spark, which lights a small piece of cotton or fabric that then a, can be used to light a small stick or um, faggot, which then can be used to light candles or cigarettes or 
um, other things of that nature. Everybody had a box like this. In excavations, we don't usually find chispas, but we often find hundreds of strikolite flints that were used to create the, the spark. Isidro Sanchez's account is the last that describes a two-story palace. The second story was removed sometime during the next 45 years, but we don't know exactly when. But the Zaguan remained the main passage for the palace from the plaza to the courtyard for perhaps another 100 or more years. In 1776, Presidio expansion and the end of Spanish rule, we learned about what was going on in the 1770s when the Spanish had their hands full with Comanche, Apache, Ute, and Navajo movements against their colonial holdings. At the same time, the Domingos Escalante expedition traveled to and opened lands in the West. Operating from a less than functional presidio behind the palace, the governor and commander of the northern provinces realized they needed a better facility and they began planning to build a new presidio with the help of soldier pension funds and local labor. An important part of their planning was figuring out how to use local labor in a way that did not disrupt farming and ranching schedules, but supplied sufficient manpower for gathering materials, making adobes, and erecting the buildings and walls. My Domenici building excavation uncovered foundations when linked, that when linked with earlier finds outlined more than 10,000 square feet of previously undocumented barracks, storerooms, and stables. My position is that these foundations and rooms, room alignments mark the location of the dilapidated presidio that was expanded and renovated from 1789 to 1791. The old Presidio rooms were remodeled into enclosed spaces that supported both presidial and, its, and administrative needs. The map drawn in 1791 is a representation of the new Presidio depicting adobe barracks, stables, and grounds that enclosed the area from present day Palace Avenue north to Federal Place and from Washington Avenue west to Grant Street. Located in the southeast corner of the Presidio, the palace is shown divided into four sections. The bulwark at the east end, the followed to the west by administrative offices, again the governor's quarters, and in the west end of the palace, a guardhouse and jail likely the one that Isidro Sanchez escaped from using a candle that he borrowed from one of its guards. These are essentially the doorways and room divisions that remained relatively stable in the, on the, along the south side of the palace until 1846 when the US Army arrived in Santa Fe. Eighteen twenty-one, the Mexican and American nineteenth-century cent American and night. I'm sorry, eighteen twenty-one, the Amer Mexican and American nineteenth century. It takes us. It starts in eighteen twenty-one, after more than a decade of conflict. Mexico achieved independence from Spain, and a new government arrived in Santa Fe. In addition to new rights, citizens of the Mexican Republic had arrived had wider access to import and export markets with the formal opening of the Santa Fe Trail. Even with these changes, the incoming administration inherited a barely functional array of government buildings and presidio. As a result, some governors chose to live in nearby houses and often left the palace for military, administrative, and commercial purposes. Demetrio Perez, the son of Governor Albino Perez, who was killed in a tax revolt in 1837, the governor was, not Demetrio, described the palace Eastern Third as having administrative offices and storage, the center housing the governor and his family, and the West was reserved for military and prison functions. This is pretty much the same building use identified in the 1791 map. 
suggesting little had changed in almost 50 years. The invading US Army arrived in 1846 and General Stephen Kearney moved into the palace and surrounding Presidio buildings. Soon after, he gave a tour of the building to a young Lieutenant Gibson who noted that a dirt floored ballroom with doors made of bull or buffalo hide hand and painted to resemble wood was present. He reported that cooks baked bread on a daily basis and roasted meat in ornos or ovens in the garden. Although he thought the building was mostly neglected, Gibson judged the palace to be bomb proof because its thick, thick walls had few doors and windows. Many or most of the exterior walls of the palace at that time and still are three feet thick. Those three foot, three foot walls, of course, provided insulation, they were defensible, and early on they supported a second story. Of course, by the time Lieutenant Gibson was there, the palace had a single story and in terms of its elevation resembled much of what we see today. And the 1861 photo we show here of the Ellsberg Amberg wagon train parked in front of the west end of the palace shows the facade of the jail and the storeroom six years before they were demolished. This is the earliest photo of the palace of the governors in the Frey and Helico Chavez photo archives collection. I think we all know and believe that there are earlier photos of the palace out there in private collections or in museum collections that haven't come to our attention. Wouldn't it be great if we could add a couple of photos from the 1850s and, early, and late 1850s to our collections so that we could kind of see the palace in its state at, at this time. Eighteen sixty six transformation and transition. This was the beginning of a major renovation of the palace and outlying buildings that was funded by the Department of Treasury that occurred from eighteen sixty seven to eighteen sixty nine. The work was completed nine years before the construction and formal designation of the Fort Mar Marcy military post. The post occupied the grounds of the Spanish Mexico studio. From 1869 to 1912, the use of the building changed from military governance to residential commercial until the completion of the new Capitol building in 1886. It housed the governor's offices and residents and the ter territorial library, secretary of the ter territory and territorial legislature. In the late 1870s, the building exterior was given a Victorian facelift in the name of modernity. Then barely 10 years after the major renovation, Governor Lew Wallace, who was so concerned about the condition of the building that he asked a panel of physicians to inspect it. The panel described the legislative halls as simply a man trap. The doctors went on to more generally condemn the structure. It, it is no ex exaggeration to say, we would not stable our horses in them. Such was the trope about the palace long spoken by Spanish, Mexican, and territorial governors alike. It seems that the, the palace was in a state of a need of constant repair and it seems even doubly more apparent from 1866 to about 1908, when almost every, every governor petitions for funds to affect some kind of repair, remodeling, or renovation of one sort or another. The 1867 map shown here depicts the layout and function of the palace and outbuilding rooms at that time. I want to call your attention to the Northwest outbuilding. It contained two rooms that housed servants. We know little about who lived in these rooms, and they are an example of a people without history 
were all the scholars tell about the pal palace's past. In the east half of the palace, you can see the two long east rooms that house the legislative assembly. West of these rooms is a cluster of four rooms. Missing in their present form is the room along Palace Avenue that had that ran north-south that had the exhibit about the palace and to its north, the exhibit room showing a timeline of, the New, Mexico, of New Mexico in the context of world history. Rooms 11 and 12 are where the former main entrance admissions desks were located. It also shows a portal on the north side of the central palace, which is no longer there. In 1898, the US Congress transferred title of the palace to the territory of New Mexico, which became liable for the costs of renovation and upkeep. The building housed the post office in the West End and the History of New Mexico, History Society of New Mexico in the East End. The last governor, George Curry, lived in the palace in 1908. In 1909, the territorial legislature passed an act establishing the Museum of New Mexico. With the dawn of a noon age and with $3,000 in hand for a heating plant and $5,000 a year for renovations, Edgar Lee Hewitt and Jesse Nussbaum set out to convert the palace into New Mexico's first museum. I'd like to go back a bit and talk about two other sub panels or smaller panels that are present, one in room five and the other, uh, both of which are in room five. One of the panels is titled The Missing Rooms. It's one of my favorite panels in the exhibit. It talks about how invisible to us now are rooms once attached to both ends of the palace. In 1867, the 350 foot long building was, was reduced by 60 feet on the west end to make room for Lincoln Avenue and another 30 feet on the east end for Washington Avenue. This framed the palace with streets named for iconic American presidents, which clearly stamped New Mexico as a United States territory. The two, what was left is a 260 foot long building, which is what we see and enjoy today. However, before demolition, the western end of the palace contained two or three dark and dingy rooms used for storage and as a jail by Spanish and Mexican governments. Early 19th century accounts describe dilapidated rooms in ruinous condition. The jail housed thieves and on occasion agents from the United States who slept on the floor. In unimaginable conditions, prisoners were fed unfamiliar food when fed at all and often had to beg for water. With the walls torn down, only the stories of the imprisoned, executed, or escaped remain. Our other panel, an antiquarian's hallway, depicts the west hallway as a narrow passageway between the portal and courtyard that dates back at least to 1867, but it all also may be the location of the western, the western, um, my battery's running low, the western, uh, the location of the uh, west hall. The hallway provided access to several businesses and institu institutions located west of the governor's quarters. This room is part of the quarters occupied by Governor L. Bradford Prince and his family in 1891. Governor Prince had many interests, including New Mexico history. He successfully lobbied in Washington, D.C. to have the History Society of New Mexico moved into the west end of the building. He displayed some of his own collection in the west hallway. The doorway at the south end of the hallway was closed when the building was converted into a museum in 1909. That's the end of my talk and thank you much, very much for listening. I'll take any questions that I have enough battery power left in my computer to answer. 
Steve, I want to thank you very much. That was a most informative uh, introduction and it's certainly a clear reflection of the amount of information and detail um, that has been collected and integrated uh, through, uh, through this uh, presentation. Um, I, I really can't uh, help but be struck by uh, how the exhibit's integration of physical, documentary, and archaeological elements provides such a truly rich history of the palace and the land upon which it was built, and also reflects the distinctive multicultural nature of the society and all its facets uh, over uh, the period in life of the, of the palace of itself. Uh, it's, uh, now, for the audience, uh, I want to remind folks that they can post their questions uh, on the YouTube chat uh, space, and we will do our best uh, to get to those uh, uh, questions uh, in, in the next few minutes. Uh, to start the Q&A session, Steve, um, I'm going to take my prerogative to ask you the first question. And um, uh, I, and really uh, what excuse I was me. doing was, uh, I was wondering. Hey, Ben, uh, excuse me. Yep. I think we lost Steve. I think his uh, battery gave up. Battery did die, yes. Yes. Well, okay. Um, well, uh, to our audience, uh, I want to thank you for participating. Uh, all the more reason, uh, if you take a moment and uh, uh, post any questions you may have uh, on, on, uh, on the YouTube, and we will do our best uh, to provide answers uh, when uh, the as the items are posted on YouTube, uh, the uh, New Mexico History Museum webpage and on uh, its Facebook page as well. Not to mention the Friends of History uh, webpage where all of our uh, lectures uh, are, uh, uh, that have been online over the last year uh, now reside. Um, we look forward to seeing you all uh, next month uh, for uh, uh, our, our, our talk on the uh, Apache Treaty of uh, 1852, I think it will be equally uh, of interest. Uh, and we're, happy, we're fortunate to have Jeff Shepard, uh, who is most knowledgeable of the treaty, able to speak uh, uh, on, on that topic. So uh, until then, um, thank you very much. And uh, do by all means, uh, take a look at our webpage uh, in terms of present and past and upcoming events. Hi, Ben. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah, Steve, yeah. you're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no problem. <laughs> okay. I'm here uh, to answer any questions there might have been. OK, well, let's, I'll, I'll start with one if I, uh, uh, if I can find it. Um, I was wondering, uh, I was commenting on, uh, on this, uh, the the um, uh, the really the richness of the exhibit uh, that that you all have been able to compile and I've certainly learned uh, even more um, uh, than uh, uh, each time I take a look at it. I was wondering if uh, you have any new takeaways of uh, for yourself uh, on the palace, given the, the the decades you have devoted to this work, um, and. Um, uh, if these site sites came about in terms of uh, your work on this particular uh, exhibit? Um, gosh, um, that's a good question. Um, some of the new insight, well, some of the new insights and something I'd really like to see pursued by new scholars um, that work you know, we'll work at the palace in the future is this, um, the topic of people without history. Um, I have to admit with some chagrin that um, in looking at the maps from the 1866, 1867, 1869 period, I looked at the, I would see the servants quarters over and over and over. And it would just never register to me, you know, that these were people of uncertain status about which we almost know nothing um, in terms of the historical accounts that I've seen or scholarly presentations um, that I've 
I've had a chance to read or, or, or hear. And I think it would be really interesting to kind of un open up the question of not necessarily slavery, slavery, although that would be part of it, but the part of servitude and um, indentured uh, status at the Palace of the Governors through time. You know, there are a few, for instance, in um, Remote Beyond Compare by Dr. John Kessel, where he talks about Vargas's um, household. We learn a little bit about the mistreatment of Don, um, Mendes, Governor Mendisabal um, of his household um, in his uh, testimony in front of the Inquisition. And moving forward, what we really don't hear very much about is what was going on with the territorial period governors and the people who were serving at the palace at that time, for instance, and that ties back into this 1867 map that's innocuously labeled servants' quarters. Mm -hmm. So that would be one, certainly one takeaway that I, I have from this doing this exhibit. I, I, if I heard you correctly in, in the course of the talk, you referenced the work you did, uh, you know, in what is now uh, the Domenici Building uh, grounds. And uh, they're talking about uh, some, some, uh, some um, excavations up in the, I believe it was the Northwest corner. And you made specific reference to them uh, as they, they were apparently servants quarters and they may have offered some, some small reflection of, uh, of the life of, of these people within that uh, archeological context. I think I actually, um, the, the two rooms in the, which are, essentially where the print shop is today. Oh, okay. What were the servants' quarters and they were renovated by um, Jesse Nussbaum and turned into um, offices essentially for the new museum um, when it opened in 1913. We didn't excavate any slave quarters that are quarters that we can attribute directly to servants based on archeological evidence um, however, something that we don't have in the exhibit, because um, we did have limited space, um, is that I believe that we excavated the foundation of a circular structure that may have been used by um, Native Americans who were working for the Spanish, um, perhaps in the, in the um, capacity of as scouts in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, that building, that structure is the only one of its kind um, found within a mission presidio by archaeologists. Right. Well, it just goes to show there's always so much more to learn uh, in, in uh, you know, in this, in this work. We do have a couple of questions. Um, and uh, what the first one was, could you talk about uh, Hewitt and Nussbaum's uh, renovations? or and the contribution to that, realize it's not archeological, but that's, uh, if you have any insights on that, we appreciate it. Great question. And very obviously there, um, this is somebody who noticed that our exhibit kind of stops with the renovation of uh, the Palace of the Governors in 1909 to 1913. Um, this was somewhat, that was somewhat intentional because we know that the remainder of the palace is still up, the programming of the palace is still being decided and will be developed over the coming years. And it's possible that a, some areas of the palace will be um, devoted to talking about Hewitt and Nussbaum's contribution to the creation of the New, Me New Museum of New Mexico. Now, having said that, um, Jesse Nussbaum and Edgar Lee Hewitt were obviously early archeologists working in North America and Central America in the early 20th century. They were completely aware of the archeological value of the Palace of the Governors and the grounds. Um, they were also very much interested in finding um, the remains of 
Ogopoge, for instance, of the Native American Pueblo that occupied the space that the Palace of the Governors then was built on top of. They were sure it was there. Um, Nussbaum, in fact, um, while, while renovating what we call affectionately Room 10, <laughs> which is the room directly east of what was formerly the main entrance to the Palace of the Governors on the south side of the building, um, where the exhibit talking about the Palace of the Governors was once located. When he was working in that room, he came across um, double wide, uh, um, two foot thick adobe walls forming a four foot thick wide, four, four foot thick wide wall. That wall was very eroded. The lower portion of the wall was so eroded that he thought he was looking at puddled adobe. He, Nussbaum and some of his colleagues interpreted the lower portion of that wall as being a remnant of the Pueblo, of the Pueblo that was built there before the Spanish arrived and that the Spanish built the Casas Reales on top of that Pueblo wall remnant essentially it's structurally impossible because Pueblo people typically built their adobe walls less than a foot thick. <laughs> so there's just no way <laughs> that it would support a four foot um, thick wall in the first place. Also, um, closer examination of that wall, the photos of the wall shows clearly um, that there are brick outlines still visible in the wall. So I think it was a little bit more wishful thinking on the part of Nussbaum than an actual find. Interestingly, in the 1930, 1931 or 1933 Historic American Buildings Survey, they cite a fact that they cite the fact that the palace was built on top of a Native American Pueblo, and they use the walls in that room as evidence. So that sort of misunderstanding or misinterpretation carried, further, carried forward for quite a while after um, Nussbaum completed his work. Fascinating story. Um, we have one additional question. You touched on, you, you did talk about this briefly at the conclusion of your uh, presentation, but uh, someone has asked what, what was the palace used for after the 1886 capital was built? So perhaps you could recap and expand on that a bit. Sure. Um, gosh, it was used for a lot of things. Um, in the west end of the palace where the exhibit is located, um, there was a, a vault uh, and a room that surrounded the vault and those, the larger room housed the um, federal depository. So it was essentially the national bank that occupied the west end of the palace at that time. There were room dividers in the room so that the east half of the room actually held the, for, the US post office. Um, as you moved further east, the, it was, the governor's quarters took up, you know, four or five rooms of the palace of the four or five rooms of that central area of the palace. We know that Edmund J. Ross, who was the governor in 18, who was installed as governor in 1880, get this right, in 1886, I believe, um, actually rented rooms out because he was so poorly paid he rented some of these extra rooms that he had um, to people for people to, you know, on a monthly basis, for instance. So the governors were taking in tenants um, at that, that time. Mm. Um, as you move further east, um, past the main entrance, uh, the former main entrance of the Palace of the Governors, um, we know that L Governor Bradford, L. Bradford Prince, before he was governor, represented the Territorial Assembly in Washington, D.C. And at, while he was there, he lobbied to have the Historical Society of New Mexico um, moved into 
the rooms at the east end of the palace. Uh, he gained approval for that and the historical society moved into those rooms. So, um, and that was in 18, that would have been in the 1890s. However, the historical society was unofficially housed in a couple of the rooms um, by the early 1880s, I believe. Well, Steve, we've, uh, uh, I wanna thank, thank you again. It's been the most informative uh, presentation. We invite everyone uh, who, who can to come and, and, and view the exhibit itself and, and also to, to, to uh, see the reopened uh, palace and all the fine work that's been done to restore it uh, over the last several, uh, several years. And knowing, knowing that there will be more exhibits uh, coming throughout the palace um, over the next uh, year, year, year or two uh, with that. Uh, for, our, uh, for our guests again, um, feel free, uh, you will find uh, this video um, on several sites, uh, both the History Museum webpage and Facebook and uh, YouTube sites, as well as the Friends of History uh, uh, site. And so uh, feel free to come back and revisit um, you know, that exhibit, uh, uh, th this presentation as, as you wish. Otherwise, we'll see you all uh, next month uh, with Jeff Shepard speaking on the Apache Treaty of 1850.